The time now is 7.30. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Van Heflin in John Adams and the American Revolution on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we tell you the story of a very remarkable man and a great American. Born a British subject, he took a leading part in the foundation of our country. It was he who was largely responsible for securing the election of George Washington as Commander-in-Chief. It was he who, in 1776, carried the resolution in the Continental Congress in Philadelphia that the colonies should assume the duty of self-government. It was he who later became United States Minister to Holland and England. And finally, as the culmination of a long career in the service of his country, he became Vice President and then President, the second President in our history, and certainly the one who lived the longest, for he died at the age of 90. Truly a remarkable man was this John Adams. And to tell his story tonight, we have used a book by Catherine Drinker Bowen called John Adams and the American Revolution. For our starring role, we are also fortunate to have with us that distinguished actor and one of our old Hallmark favorites, Van Heflin. And now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. One of the particular joys of Christmas is sending and receiving Christmas cards. While the pleasure Christmas cards bring can never be measured, isn't it good to know that Hallmark cards are priced the same this year as they were last year, and the year before, and the year before that? and that the quality of Hallmark cards has constantly improved throughout the years. Yes, today, just as for many Christmas seasons, that Hallmark on the back of your card is looked for and welcomed. It tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting John Adams and the American Revolution, starring Van Heflin. <laughs> The procession winds slowly through the cobblestone streets of Philadelphia. In the principal carriage, John Adams smiles and nods to the waving onlookers. His right hand reaches across the seat to find another hand, a hand smaller by far, smooth and lovely and trembling. Abby, you're frightened. A little. Well, you mustn't be. I'm not. I know. I can't imagine anything that would daunt you. I've never seen you shrink back or wonder what to do or doubt the outcome. There have been times when you, you never saw them. John, you mean you kept them from me? When? When? In the days when I was still on my father's farm and I could see no future for myself. At Harvard, when I was convinced of it. In Worcester, when I had proof of it. John, John, every young lawyer must expect to lose cases. But my very first, Mr. Putman, a, a simple writ of trespass and I lost. My boy, you're trying to eat up life all in one swallow. You're young, you're brilliant. The world will find it out soon enough. Perhaps when I'm old and bald and beyond caring, I want a name in the colonies. I want a, a home, a farm, a wife, children. A wife, eh? A man with your impetuosity should have no trouble there. Do you have someone in mind? Oh, no, no one, sir. And even if I had, there'd be no hope. I have nothing to offer, nothing. Uh, time will change all that, my boy. Wait and work. Youth is 
so violent and impatient, wait and work. I did both. I began to win my way in court to know important men and to glow with new ideas. When my father died and left me his farm, I added a new interest. I began stopping by Reverend Smith's home for advice in gardening and livestock. One afternoon, I cut across the meadow intending to look at sheep. Suddenly, without warning, I found myself flat on the ground, looking up at an angry ram about to charge again. No, no, Thomas! Stop it! Stop it, I say! Oh, sir, are you hurt? Uh, no, no, just surprised. So sorry. Let me help you walk. Oh, thank you. I thank you, ma'am. Uh, wouldn't you like to come up to the house and clean up? I could brew you some tea. Uh, are, are you working for the Smiths? Oh, I am a Smith. I'm Abigail. Don't you remember me, Mr. Adams? Good heavens. Well, the last time I saw you, you were... Well, <laughs> you were hardly more than a child. It's, it's amazing how you, you've grown. <laughs> I'm 17. I've just gotten back to my grandparents. Mr. Adams, you're not listening. Oh, oh wasn't I? Uh, Miss Smith, I, I think I do want that cup of tea. My visits to Reverend Smith's home became more frequent. While I talked gardening and livestock, my mind was filled with visions of soft brown hair and even softer brown eyes. Abigail grew quieter, more shy with every visit. One evening, there was a violent thunderstorm. The wind whined through the storm shutters and finally blew out the parlor lamps. Father, you stay here with Mother. I'll bring some candles for me. Oh, I'll, I'll go with you, Abigail. All right. Knocked you down. Oh, <laughs> first time I did it with our old ram and Abby. And... Yes. Don't talk. No, no, don't, don't pull away. Stay here. Mm-hmm. My darling. Oh, how could you have been so sure of me? I wasn't. I was only sure of my love for you. My dearest. Oh, my dearest. We were married by Abby's father, and the following year, our first daughter was born. My happiness at home didn't buy, blind me to the unhappiness ahead. George III was sending troops to garrison the colonies against possible French attacks. Times were hard. There was a money panic in Boston, and British added to it by talk of a stamp tax. Rioting broke out, and a mob of 2,000 marched through the streets of Boston. Mob violence, I abhorred, but there must be justice. I appealed for it in an open letter to the Massachusetts legislature. I demanded vindication of our rights and our liberties before the world. To my surprise, others began to quote my letter and to seek me out for advice. My cousin Sam came to see me, Sam Adams, the most popular man in Boston, the collector of taxes, who purposely forgot to collect them. You've buried yourself in the country long enough, John. Move to Boston. You owe it to your family, to your practice, and to the people of Massachusetts. The time is coming when we shall need your courage, my cousin. The Stamp Act was withdrawn by a frightened parliament. But shortly, there were new taxes, fresh aggravations. Boston proved an uneasy home for Abby and the children. Night after night, I was away with my cousin Sam at some meeting of protest. British troops patrolled the streets but they were more frightened than frightening. They wished no part of an angry people. All Boston knew that an explosion must come. It occurred one night at the very steps of the Custom House. What are we waiting for? There are only nine red coats and we're a hundred. Where are them shiver boys? They don't care, fire. Sound the lock. Five Boston men were killed. The soldiers who had fired on them were jailed for murder. When I reached my office the following morning, I found a friend of the prisoners waiting for me. 
very innocent men, Mr. Adams. They fired in self-defense. Have you come here to tell me that, Mr. Forrester? Oh, the town has gone crazy, sir. People are already calling it the Boston Massacre. And they mean that Captain Preston and his soldiers will hang for it. There's no hope for them, sir. Unless... Unless what? Mr. Adams, I've already talked to three of the king's lawyers. Not a one will defend the soldiers. They dare not for fear of the people. They dare not? The crown refuses to protect its own soldiers? Why, that's unthinkable. And yet true. Mr. Adams, listen. Yes. People know you're Captain Preston's friend. They must have come here, seen you come here. They're at the door. Where can I go? No, you stay here. I'll talk to them. Come on. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, what can I do for you? Send Forrester out here. He's a friend of those murdering redcoats. Also my client, gentlemen. Quiet! You hear that, boy? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Mr. Adams is taking British gold. Maybe you're going to defend Captain Preston and his bloody crew, too. I intend to do just that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. My friends, yeah, yeah, yeah. please, friends. If I may save from death one unfortunate victim of tyranny or of ignorance equally fatal, that I must do. Whether it be for king or for colony, the rights of one man and of truth must prevail. Though it bring me your contempt and the contempt of all mankind. Now, gentlemen, please excuse me. Mr. Adams, you'll never regret this day. No, but others will. The mistaken folly of our people is only exceeded by that of King George and his advisers. Where it will lead, Providence alone knows. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of John Adams and the American Revolution, starring Van Heflin. In all probability, exactly eight weeks from tonight, you'll be sitting with the family, putting finishing touches on Christmas packages. Your Christmas cards will be in the mail. If you want those cards to reflect your own good taste and represent your own true feelings about Christmas, may I offer two suggestions? First, select them now while you have time to make your choice leisurely and carefully. Second, ask to see the Hallmark Christmas card album when you go in to make your selection. You'll find Hallmark albums in fine stores across the country. And in them, I believe you'll find the one card you'll want for your very own. The one, above all others, you'll want imprinted with your name. You'll find cards that express the deep significance of this holy season. Ones that bring back memories of other Christmases. And cards that are designed simply to add merriment to this merriest of holidays. Yes, there's a Hallmark Christmas card you'll want for your very own, one that you'll be proud to send and that will be received with pleasure. For remember, that Hallmark on the back adds meaning to the card you send. It tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton and the second act of John Adams and the American Revolution, starring Van Heflin. Philadelphia is in holiday mood. As the carriage bears John and Abigail Adams through the city streets, John's thoughts turn back to earlier times, to the days of the struggle and the nights of doubt, which he and Abby would never forget. When I agreed to defend the British soldiers against the people of Boston, I knew what to expect. My patriotic friends fell away from me, and my enemies on the king's side distrusted me. The word traitor was hurled at my face stones at my back. I was not proud of my countrymen for the Boston Massacre or for their wholesale perjury during the trial of the accused. But in the end, justice was done. Captain Preston and the King's soldiers were acquitted. Sam Adams was one of the first to congratulate me. You did right, cousin. I never doubted your motives, and those who have will come to understand. Well, it may take a long while, Sam. Not as long as you may think. There will be new incidents more oppression from the crown, and we shall act with more justice. 
Meanwhile, I propose to see your election to public office. <laughs> Sam. Sam, you could sooner elect the public hangman. No, no. I'm content to spend my days with Abby and my children. That is my ambition. But not your destiny. The time will come, John. It will come. Sam was a true prophet. I was elected to the general court and after that appointed chief justice of Massachusetts. But meanwhile, Britain heaped mistake upon mistake until finally Sam Adams gave the signal for new resistance. Three ships in Boston Harbor were boarded and 342 chests of tea were dumped into the bay. Parliament's answer was slow in coming. And then severe and cruel beyond all expectation, Sam watched it with me from my office window. Three regiments of them, John. Yes. Warships crowding the bay, a complete blockade by land and sea. Boston is shut off from all trade with the neighbors, all sources of food and fuel. Starvation is what they intend for us. And for me, a more special fate. You've read the notices? Yes, just now. All disturbers of the king's peace to be transported to England for trial. Well, if that's what they want, they'll have to take me to and half of Boston. There's no turning back for us now. Today it's Boston, tomorrow it'll be New York or Philadelphia. Act, Sam. Act while there's time. Within the week, Sam called for a meeting in Philadelphia of all 13 colonies, a Continental Congress. I was appointed a delegate from Massachusetts. John. Yes, my dear. If anything should happen now, to you... Now, Abby, Abby, you promised me. I promised to get the children out of Boston to move everything possible into the country. But I cannot promise away the terrors of my heart. My dear, I'll be back within two months. Or never. Abby. My darling, we're no longer two young lovers who can laugh at life and believe our happiness is without end. We're old enough to know every risk. Your cousin Sam still lives only by accident. At any moment, the troops may take him and you. And the end is a prison noose. John, if that happens, I don't wish to live another day, another hour. My dearest. Goodbye. Goodbye. Abby knew and I knew that on that day, our old pleasant life together was ended. We would be separated by distance and by events for long years ahead. In Philadelphia, the Congress was torn between two loyalties, to the king, however misguided, or to the colonies, however right they might be. Gentlemen, throughout this continent, government is dissolved. Landmarks are dissolved. The distinctions between Virginians, Pennsylvanians, New Yorkers, New Englanders are no more. I am not a Virginian, but an American. That was Patrick Henry. The Congress listened in stunned silence to a new idea. Complete and absolute independence. Do not blink at the fact, gentlemen, we must have an army. War is not far off. It was nearer than any of us knew. On a clear, cold morning in April, the soldiers of the king and the farmers of Massachusetts lay dead in the field of Lexington and Concord. Gentlemen, the time has come. I nominate as commander-in-chief of the Grand American Army, Colonel Washington of Virginia. Events moved swiftly. The British attacked Bunker Hill and burned Charleston. From a hilltop, Abigail and my children looked on and smelled the smoke of battle. My dearest John, we are still safe but very lonely. The friends you and I once loved have gone over to the king. Every week sees one of your old clients take ship for England. The people, alas, are still two-thirds Tory. There's little wood for cooking and less food to be cooked. The children's clothing is in shreds and your savings all spent. Would that we had more to sacrifice. Sam, 
Do you realize how long we've been in Philadelphia? Over a year. Yes, over a year since I've seen Abby. The war goes on, men die, and still the delegates refuse to face the situation. They still prate of loyalty to the crown, peace with Britain. Which we are about to answer. I have the honor, my cousin, to report that you have just been named to a committee to draft the colony's Declaration of Independence. At last it was to be. The great document was chiefly the writing of Tom Jefferson. My work came when the declaration was presented to the full Congress. It was the 1st of July. The delegates sat wiping their foreheads in the fierce heat. Overhead thunder rolled through the clouded air. I remembered another thunderstorm, the night I first kissed Abigail. Today would decide another union. Mr. Chairman, to escape from the protection of Britain by declaring independence would be like destroying our house in winter and exposing a growing family before we've got another shelter. Gentlemen, let us not launch forth into the unknown. Let us be loyal to what we know. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Adams of Massachusetts. It is true that we launch into the unknown. How lucky we are for that. Never before have three millions of people had such an opportunity to form and establish the wisest and happiest government that human wisdom can conceive. I have heard here today the spoken fears of those who would cling to their fortunes, their hopes, or royal favors. They say continued war and independence will ruin us. I reply, let ruin come, so long as we are free men before God. As for me, the day may come when my children reproach me for what I do here. They shall live to live upon thin diet, wear mean clothes, and work hard. This I bequeath them in freedom and honor. If they value it not, they are not my children, and I care not whether they live or die. Gentlemen, we are 13 colonies. Let us be as 13 clocks. Let us all strike the hour together. Let the stroke ring throughout this land together for independence. There was no applause, only silence. The next day, the voting began. Pennsylvania, aye. South Carolina, aye. Virginia, aye. Massachusetts, I, Delaware, I. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. John? Hmm? Y yes, dear. I'm all right now. Thank you for holding my hand. Oh, I had uh, forgotten I was. I know. And I know what you were thinking about. You always have. Yes, here in Philadelphia, we gave the world a new ideal. Here this nation was born. Here our first president took his oath. And now, in just a few minutes, there will be a second president. Abby. Yes? Give me your hand. John. Yes, my dear, I think I'm a little frightened. I'll need you more now than ever before. Ben 
Van Heflin and James Hilton will return in a moment. There's one particular card in the Hallmark album that I'd like to tell you about. It's the kind you'll want to buy for yourself. One that serves as a thoughtful holiday gift as well as a Christmas message to your friends. It's the Hallmark Christmas Card Train. Designed to hold all the other Christmas cards one receives, the Hallmark Christmas Card Train comes in its own special mailing envelope. When assembled, the train is six inches high and 38 inches long. There's an engine, three gay cars, and a bright red caboose. On the caboose is a place for your name imprint. And so the Christmas card with your name on it becomes an important part of the holiday decorations in your friends' homes to be admired by all. At fine stores everywhere, you can see the Hallmark Christmas card train assembled. You'll see how very attractive it is when filled with cards and placed on a table, under the tree, or on the mantel. You can order 12 or more to be imprinted with your name, or you can buy the Hallmark Christmas card train in any quantities and sign your name personally. But whatever you do, just don't miss the Hallmark Christmas card train. Here again is James Hilton. You gave us a great picture of a great man tonight, Van Heflin. Thank you. Well, it was an honor to play John Adams, Jimmy. I enjoyed it as I always do enjoy the roles that you asked me to play on Hallmark Playhouse. Tell me, how do you manage to find such interesting stories week after week? Well, you know, Van, sometimes we start with an idea. For instance, tonight's story came to mind because this week we celebrate the United Nations, whose charter is only six years old. Let's hope it lives and thrives as well as the charter that John Adams planned nearly a century and three quarters ago. Yes, indeed. The world can certainly do with more friendliness and understanding. And on that score, Hallmark cards do a good job when it comes to individual friendship and thoughtfulness. We hope that in its way, Hallmark Playhouse succeeds as well, then. Next week, we're going to bring you an American classic, Longfellow's Evangeline, one of the great tales of our literature. And as our star, we are pleased to invite that delightful actress, Joan Fontaine. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Leonard St. Clair. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Van Heflin will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, My Son John. The role of Abigail tonight was played by Lorene Tuttle. Ted Osborne was Sam. Others in our cast included Gerald Moore, Ted DeCorsia, Bill Johnstone, and Polly Bear. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at this same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Joan Fontaine in Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's Evangeline. And the week following, Louis Jordan in Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And the week after that, Emerson Huff's Mississippi Bubble on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is the PBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.